How many people know Burn? Okay. <laughs> you got some newbies. <laughs> All right. So patients do not simply want to avoid disease. They want to be healthy. While U.S. emergency rooms are extremely good at resolving a true acute care crisis, like getting hit by a car, the system does not get people healthy. For example, many of the most popular prescription drugs in the U.S. today do not cure any disease. They simply reduce or mask symptoms and have serious side effects. Statins, CoQ10, depletion, and muscle pain, sometimes uh, death. So, um, Bert is going to talk to us about longevity, preventing aging diseases. Please welcome Bert Friedlander. Just a little background of myself. I uh, graduated in 1972 from San Francisco State in exercise physiology. And I worked as a um, physical therapist for six, seven years. Then I did, I worked with the Edgar Casey Foundation. Oh, yes. Okay, wait, wait. We in okay, and I think Edgar's around here somewhere. You know, are you familiar with Edgar Casey? Well, look into that. I did a lot of work there. And then I got into chiropractic school later on in the, uh, from 78 to 81. So, in 1972, I got into nutritional research with a guy named Leo Stein, who was probably the most brilliant person I first encountered with. And, and he took me as a pupil, but as a son, and taught me everything about nutrition, vitamins, and B-complex back in the 70s. As a matter of fact, there was an article in Chronicle where I was taking white bread away from the shelves, and they recorded, they took a picture of it, and it says, uh, Gentlemen's removing uh, white bread from the shelves. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's about getting rid of, you know, uh, types of non nutritional values from breads. Mm -hmm. So then I got into 81, uh, 78, I got uh, my background also. I played professional soccer, I coached professionally, and I ran track and field. I was selected by the U.S. Olympic team in the 68, but I refused to run because I only ran track one year and I didn't have the mindset to do so. And so it gave me a lot of learning abilities from playing sports because in 1978 I ended up working at UCLA while I was going through chiropractic school and never attended school, but I was down on the field and I was selected in 1980-84 by the U.S. Olympic team to run the 80-84 Olympic uh, performance uh, and coaching and training and nutritional. So I got into uh, the rehab end of sports medicine and designed the first nutritional uh, non-steroid amino acid program. And I learned so much about steroids and I had to learn about it to understand what amino acids and what nutrients can enhance performance the same way as human growth hormones or anything like that and discovered uh, by applying the first amino acid complex in 1980-84 and we had a boycott in 1980 so we didn't have uh, we weren't doing uh, we had to retrain our athletes for 84 and in 84 we had the highest performance results of gold medalists in our group through our performance enhancing kind of non-steroid use of nutrition and supplementation and mindset and what I learned from all that, working in 86, I worked with the Raiders, and the first year I worked with them, they won the Super Bowl. Then I worked in 87 with the Lakers, and the first year I worked with them, they won the World Championship. And it was all about designing a program and mental attitude. I was very fortunate that I had somebody from Tony Robbins as a patient of mine who started working with us and we started doing mental performance, you know, looking in the mirror and looking at yourself and enhancing performance. But the key was positive attitude, you know, wake them, waking up in the morning and having a positive attitude. You know, that's the most powerful tool you have. I'm going to give you the tools that really have value in longevity and aging. So in 1981, I got into cancer research in 82, 83, 84, I got into caloric restriction research. Then in 87, 86, I got into orthomolecular research on aging and cancer and disease. And so I was a sponge 
not in school, not in class, but outside of school, I became a sponge in learning about health and nutrition and quality of life. And all my patients were either sports or they were celebrities. Julia Roberts, uh, Sylvester Stallone, Steven Seagal, Arnold Schwartz. So they were into what I was doing, longevity research, nutrition, and performance, and positive attitude. So I applied all these things, and while I was doing all this, I also learned. I learned a lot about the human body, and then recently, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, I started working with Ohio State University College of Medicine with Vernon Stevens on cancer, and I'll share a lot of things about cancer that's profound today, and also at uh, Florida AMM with Elizabeth Maggio, a brilliant scientist, we looked at botanicals and compounds that have anti-inflammatory, epigenetic factors, anti-tumor factors, proliferating factors, all of that. And we started looking at methylene blue and colloidal silver and profound effects from natural medicine. Natural medicine is probably your gift and, and we can talk about more of that. But then I got into a program and I studied with a guy who was doing chemistry of life. And then I started talking to a guy named Robert Watts, who, as you know, the cricket and DNA. And he was talking about something on Charlie Rose, which I was working with, was biochemistry of the cells, going back to the DNA, the RNA, but the mitochondria. In 1987, 88, 90, I got into mitochondrial research. Didn't know anything about it. So I've been learning everything I can. Today is probably the biggest research in the whole industry. Harvard is doing it, UC Davis, uh, USC. It's uh, discovering the chemistry of cells. What Robert Watts said something profound when we, uh, when we spoke about this way back 10 years ago or so. He says, we got to go back to understanding who we are in the cell, how the cell functions. And so what I did was I wanted to find out the chemistry of life. Where did we come from? How did we get here? And who are we? You know that about 3.8 billion years ago, there were dynamic situations that were happening on the earth. You can call it God, whatever you want. If you're religious, fine. But things happened that created life. Was the, this, uh, where the earth was located from the sun, from the moon, was dynamic in creating life. The content of oxygen in the atmosphere had the perfect uh, oxygen level for creating life, CO2. And there were thermodynamic volcanic vents in various locations of the world that were producing the, the tools that are necessary that created wonderful life, living systems, everything. The chemical that started everything was, you know, vats. Cars. All this came from the elements of the ocean and the vents and all that. And then when I started understanding this, that chemistry started in the right environment, the right conditions of the sun, uh, of the temperature. It had to be the right temperature of 72 degrees. It had to be the distance from the sun to the earth, the moon to the earth. If you think about it, if we were any type closer to the sun, we would probably burn to death and destroy ourselves. If we were too far away from the sun, we'd probably freeze. So these elements created a perfect environment. And one of the things that people were missing out was salt. It was the right salt conditions in the environment at that time. It was called the continent of fungi. The fungi was a great element that started life and living systems and birds and fish and reptiles and everything. Salt was important. And we don't even take enough salt in our body because salt created our digestive system. The hydrochloric acid, pepsin. Without salt, you cannot have hydrochloric acid and pepsin. So we need a salt, we need sulfur. We need all these things. These are conditions that create a life. The amino acids of life was alanine, glycine, and uh, alanine, glycine, and lysine were the key components that created life. These were the uh, important factors of the amino acids 
that were found and discovered. And man duplicated these life forms back in the chemistry and they were able to produce these elements of fatty acids and sugars and glucose and all of these. So once I understood where life came from and the chemistry of life, there was a bacteria billions of years ago that started everything, every living system. This bacteria was called mitochondria. And the mitochondria involved into different elements and created fish and created plants and created reptiles and created animals. Everything was created by this mitochondria. Why? This mitochondria had the energy ability to make energy and to create replication and duplication of cells and everything else. So once we understood about mitochondria, we understood that mitochondria was essential to create everything, every component of who we are, of every system. Plants have mitochondria, you know, all of that. So that's why today there's a big research on mitochondria and all of that. So once we understood about mitochondria, then we understood how it works and the importance of the mitochondria in ourselves. You and I wouldn't be able to stand up or get up or think or ability to exercise and move without the mitochondria. Well, let me ask you, what is important, going back 65,000 to 100,000 years ago, 200,000, we had light, natural light. We were outdoors. We didn't have anything over us. We were hunters. We were gatherers. Western Price. You know, I, I studied him quite a bit, and, and, and we did a lot of research at the same time. So, um, light was so important because light created photosynthesis and created the mitochondria and created a cytochrome oxidase enzyme. This enzyme is so important in making energy. It's an electron transport mechanism. It takes electrons and oxygen and gives us the energy. And the way we get cytochrome oxidase enzyme <coughs> is through light, red light, orange light, infrared light, sunlight. And the human body needs 14 to 15 hours of light a day. And I will, I'll give you some examples of some of my patients I'm working for free. I don't charge for cancer patients or MS or Parkinson's or anybody. So I will give you the information. And we've seen turnarounds and people like Parkinson's walking again, able to get out of bed for the first time. Cancer patients in remission where they had 10 years of battling of nonstop cancer growth. It was by getting them outdoors, getting them in the sun, giving them natural lightings indoor that gives us the same full, full spectrum light. These are the factors that we need to create in our life again. And that is the most valuable tool you'll have. When I take a cancer patient, I said the first thing I want you to do is just give me plenty of light a day. And that's the first thing I start with them because nothing will work. I can give them every uh, nutrient, every compound out there. Yes, they'll get better. We'll put them in remission for a while, but they are not going to heal themselves until they get natural lighting. And another way I tell them to go is get infrared heat lamps. And you've got, and it's a simple $10, $15 device that has so much profound effect by increasing cytochrome oxidase enzyme in your body and by bringing back the natural photosynthesis that your human body needs, which is lacking and it's becoming disease and decaying and aging. And so putting an infrared heat lamp, just a clear infrared heat lamp for 15, 20 minutes in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, helps dramatically. And I've seen patients recover from every ailment out there just by doing that and getting natural lighting. Simple things like that have the most profound effects. So aging and inflammation, there's no doubt. Inflammation is just an environmental factor we can have stresses in our lives. You know, we can get hit, we can have accidents, uh, we can have bacteria, heavy metals, chemicals, all of these things. One of the things I learned in caloric restriction diet 
why it extends lifespan in animals. We know it may extend in some humans, but we're not 100% sure that putting people in, in a stressful condition like reducing calories like that strictly has any merit in human studies. We haven't done enough of that, but I did some at UCLA with patients. The patients I took were some athletes, some regular patients. And this thing keeps falling down. Can uh, you keep it in your hand, please? Yes, I'll keep it in my hand. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what we found is caloric restriction diet, what it really is intended to do, and the uh, blood tests were done in animals, and, the, and then what I did in some of the human studies, is found that it reduces oxidative stress to mitochondria. That was the big factor of this whole caloric restriction, intermittent fasting autophagy mechanism. The less you can reduce mitochondrial damage, because the mitochondria is a 24-hour burning machine. It's like a fireplace. You put fire in there, everything you eat, protein, fats, carbs, have to be broken down and oxidized to glucose. So you have this ability of this Krebs cycle, pyruvic and all that, and cytochrome oxidase, all of these electron oxidation factors, reductions factors, the body breaks the foods down and has to break it down and oxidize to glucose. Glucose is the final end stage of the mitochondria to make ATP. And through ATP, it's the fuel of the gasoline that you drive the car. And this ATP then is converted to CO2. And CO2 then is converted to water. It's like you know, this uh, exchange into water and then CO2 exchange into oxygen and waits for the hemoglobin, the blood, to provide another four or five molecules of oxygen in exchange, and you have to have it. In cancer cells, they don't have the ability to oxidize glucose well. So they don't go through the pyruvic mechanism and they, they perform and they break down fatty acids or proteins and then it becomes lactic acid. And lactic acid is now converted to ammonia and carbon monoxide. And this fuels the cancer cells over and over. And that's what Robert Watts said in his television show with, Watts, uh, with Charlie Rose, is this inability of the body to oxidize glucose to convert to ATP, to CO2, to water, now it's breaking down into lactic acid ammonia, carbon monoxide, which is toxic to every other cell, but cancer cells survive with it. We need to convert that, change that. And how do we change it? Well, there are many ways we can talk about it, and I can tell you how to do it very easily. And we've done it. DCA was a very popular <coughs> drug in Calgary because it takes, it, it takes lactic acid back to CO2. That's the whole thing, is bringing lactic acid back to CO2. Breathing, exercise, just breathing, uh, doing uh, uh, back breathing is important. Um, I breathe every day. I do CO2 breathing every morning and at night. And I'll teach you how to do that. It's very simple. It's very powerful. It, does, it may do more than any nutrition you'll ever take because breathing is the function of all living systems and we don't breathe enough. We're very shallow breathers. So we're not enhancing oxygen in our cells and we're not increasing mitochondrial function and all these things. So the mitochondria needs sunlight, needs natural lighting, needs nanometers of wavelength from the orange red to the infrared spectrum and that's how it survives. It increases mitochondria, increases complex four. Okay, and that's how methylene blue works. Methylene blue, which I talk a lot about, which I have two people right now with Parkinson's walking again because they took methylene blue. It increases complex four, which helps with cytochrome oxidase enzyme, and then increases mitochondrial function. Basically, the next function is nitric oxide. It suppresses nitric oxide because nitric oxide is a inflammatory mechanism in cancer, in uh, Parkinson's, and it's very high in Parkinson's and MS and Alzheimer's. It suppresses 
mitochondria, and thyroid function. And like I said, the thyroid is so important. It's the most important organ you have because the thyroid and mitochondria work together. You have a good thyroid, you have a good mitochondria. You have a good mitochondria, you've got a good thyroid. They work together by increasing metabolism and energy and having a positive attitude every morning and sleeping at night. And I find that when I put my patients who I'm working with is they get more sunlight, they get more natural lighting, they sleep better. Why? Circadian. The hormones all function on light. Everything is run by circadian hormone. You know that you have cortisol level at night. It's a circadian function. But you can reduce that by limiting the inflammatory mechanism at night. By eating less <laughs> at night and eating the, the right foods. By increasing red light, orange light, or any of those lights at night. Turning off your computers, your television at night. Sleep without having your computers on. Turn off and unplug everything at night. Because if you don't sleep at night and you don't recover, you don't get seven to eight hours of good regenerative sleep, you're not going to heal. It doesn't make a difference. You need to regenerate because at night is when you regenerate. The daytime, your body works in a catabolic way. It breaks down everything. It goes through stresses of life, through irritation from food, from stresses of living and handling the traffic and money. But at night, you want to calm the body. You want to bring the body to a seven, to 0 0.5 hertz to 4 hertz. That is the delta wavelength. That is where your deep sleep comes from. You've got to put your body back into the deep rim of sleep, which is 0 0.5 hertz, which is so low, below everything, your cell phones operate on what? Gigahertz, megahertz. We're in a billion and thousands and hundreds of thousands of hertz throughout the day through fluorescent lighting, through Wi-Fi, television, radio, phones, and every time you drive and you're talking to your Bluetooth, you're doubling the exposure to EMF, right? You wrote it, you did a good paper on that in a, a, a lecture. So EMF is real, folks. England just reported back that there's a double of exposure of brain tumors since the use of cell phones. Our just study will support that. Yes, yes. And I'm on the board of the uh, UC Berkeley's environmental with Joel Moskowitz. Anybody knows him? Yeah. He's a brilliant, brilliant individual. So we need at nighttime to eliminate everything. So what I do is I unplug everything. I take my circuit breaker in the bedroom and I turn everything off. I want to have clean energy. I don't want to have any electromagnetic influence while I'm sleeping because I want to create my brain to go into that 0 0.5 hertz up to 4 hertz during the night. That is where healing occurs in that range of frequency and that is way below. You know that your heart resonates at what frequency? Anybody else? I worked with the uh, pacemaker guy who invented in England and then uh, Ray uh, Tawako 1.14 hertz. You know how low that is? It takes one second for uh, a complete wavelength of one second for one wavelength uh, to go positive, negative, back. It takes one second for that wavelength. Your phones go like this in, the, in, 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 like in billions and millions of cycles per second. So you're overstimulating the body and the body doesn't know how to handle that. You're always stimulating the mitochondria. The mitochondria doesn't work on that level. It works on a different level. The mitochondria needs the 0 0.5 hertz at night to, to the 4 hertz in order to regenerate and rebuild and reprocess the whole function again. And the heart works on that level and your thyroid works on that. So we're over inundated by EMF, Wi-Fi, television, radio. Unplug everything. So two things I tell my patient, get plenty of light, natural light, get yourself a, uh, a clear heat lamp and put it on two, three times a day. Get something, if you're indoors, get near a window and work by a window. If you don't have it, go buy yourself a 250 watts or incandescent light that is in the 5,000, 1,000 luminous or 5,000 luminous. You want to create a lot of light. So. Um, 
So we got to get back in, in, into the 65,000 years ago where our genes expression started. And we have epigenetic genes. So the environment changes our genes. It turns on and turns off. Epigenetic genes are basically light switches. There's more light switches in our bodies than anything else. There's more uh, uh, microbes in our body, bacteria, than there are genes, or DNA, or mitochondria. Did you know that? So the gut is really an important area. And I'll talk to you about some exciting things on the gut, and how it works, and, uh, and what we're doing with it. Uh, so understanding that, you know, our genes uh, are controlled by our epigenetics. How we control it is due to the environment we create, the light we produce, the foods we're going to eat, and the sleep we get. And genes are also controlled by zinc, B6, glycine, amino acids. They're controlling our genes expression. So if we're lacking magnesium or zinc or glycine or any of these compounds, Yes, if we don't get enough polyphenolics, you know, from our foods, if we don't eat the right foods, <coughs> what is the right foods? There are inflammatory foods out there that are dramatic, you know. One of the things we learned in the caloric restriction diet is that certain proteins are inflammatory in nature. And the ones that Richard uh, Miller discovered as well, he was right on. He discovered that tryptophan and, and methionine and cysteine have inflammatory mechanisms that suppress your mitochondria and thyroid function. So foods that are high in that, and that's where whey comes in, but I'll share with you how you suppress those foods, like taking whey. We found, we did a study with whey protein on our athletes, and we found little uh, uh, problems with digestion and other things like that, and a little weight gain came out of it. But when we added Knox gelatin collagen back in the 80s, I was the first one to introduce collagen in the form of gelatin back in 83, 84, and 85, 86, 87 to the uh, Olympic athletes, the way we talked about at dinner, is that it makes sense because I learned that these amino acids, these proteins have valuable non-inflammatory mechanisms, but building and repairing and regenerate because the spinal cord the norocord was the first uh, element that was found in, in, in living systems like fish or like reptilians. They had to have the spinal cord called the norocord, which is 99% collagen, which then developed the peripheral nerves and the myelin sheath and allowed for energy to go up to the brain. And by giving my athletes in 84, 85 as an alternative to steroids, we started using Knox gelatin and vitamin D and calcium and vitamin C. And we saw dramatic results. We saw repair and less injuries. We did that with Pete Carroll and, and the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, and they saw the same re uh, results. We did some studies with Ohio State recently on that. And that's how I got into collagen. And I learned about the mechanism of collagen. In 1984, 85, I, I worked with a chemist, a brilliant chemist, who developed the first collagen, hydrolyzed collagen for me to use with my athletes rather than gelatin, because gelatin is a little bit difficult to dissolve in water and heats up and you have jello, but jello is good for you. You should eat it every day. So we found that the kinds of protein are very important. And we discovered that in our studies that proteins that are non-inflammatory and inflammatory meaning they suppress thyroid function, they cause kidney problems by affecting glute, the gene glutho, and I'll talk about this gene glutho, which I, uh, I have in here, we just added that, so if I can, uh, let me go there, I oh, know, go in the wrong direction, like always, I always, okay, here, glutho gene, very important. The biggest problem we have today let me finish up the protein thing. So we found that three amino acids are very crucial in all inflammatory mechanism and reactive oxygen. Tryptophan, methionine, cysteine. You need them, but you need them in very low levels. So why caloric restriction diet had profound effects, eliminated a lot of the protein that was causing these 
regulatory mechanisms, such as those three. And number two, it eliminated heavy metals. A lot of heavy metals in our water, in our air, and you know, in, in sort of our food have very damaging effects in mitochondrial function and causes reactive oxygen species. So the more reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria, like burning the fuel, the more problems we have, and that's where autophagy came in. Autophagy is a mechanism, and I'll give you a brief mechanism. Your body is an incredible recycling ability. It knows how to sweep the floor, which is around the uh, mitochondria. It takes a pan and puts it in there, and then takes it out to the garbage. That's autophagy. And then from the garbage, there's another system that comes and takes them outside of the gar of the area and recycles uh, out of there. It either recycles recycles the uh, the uh, you know the damaged proteins, the mitochondria, uh, damaged cells, whatever from overuse, extensive stress, and it's a wear and tear. You know, we, every day we use our body, we, we, we also wear and tear our body, and cancer is constantly <laughs> growing every day because it's a natural stressor, but our body knows how to get rid of it. As long as we're healthy, we know how to get rid of it. So autophagy is a mechanism of getting the damaged misfolding protein, and misfolding protein is when the body, always, uh, the, the protein always sends messages out all the time, like a, a plane, and that plane gets uh, dropped to a location, it opens up and reads the message, and then understands what to do, close it back, sends it to another location. Keeps unfolding, 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 until you don't fold it back correctly. It's a simple mechanism of called misfolding protein. The body knows how to handle that and removes it out of the system. It recycles everything out. It either uses for energy or just gets rid of it through urine, fecal, or burns it to fuel through a mitochondria that's efficiently working and uses as energy. And that's where your intermittent fasting comes from. And that's where limiting inflammatory proteins come from. They do the same thing. Mushrooms have the same profound effect of increasing autophagy. There's a uh, sugar called trade halos. Trade halos is a sugar that also has this ability that is manufactured by your mushrooms, has the ability to do autophagy. And movement, energy, all of that. Increasing cytochrome oxidase enzymes, light therapy does the same thing. It increases autophagy mechanisms. While you're sleeping at night, it does that for you if you eliminate all the electromagnetic pollution around you. It does that for you. So your body's doing that all the time, and that's why you're staying healthy. And also, it also regulates your P53, so it recognizes cancer cells before they start growing and it stops them, cause apoptosis. That's where zinc and amino acids like lysine and lysine <coughs> and your green tea and eating cruciferous vegetables that have to be cooked or boiled to get rid of the, uh, uh, all these acids that causes thyroid damage. So cooking your food is very important. Matter of fact, if you read the studies on, on uh, how our brain developed, how did our brain really develop? compared to the lion or tiger or, or giraffe or anybody else or cat or mice. We cooked meat. When we started cooking meat, our mandible, uh, the genes here started declining and becoming smaller and they allowed for our brain to grow. Eric Rangham read his book at Harvard. He did the longest research of anybody on the growth of the brain and how it developed. And he's right on because we also saw that in the caloric restriction diet. When we started using cooked foods, we saw changes in the brain function. So cooking food was very valuable in creating our brain. That's why tigers have similar brains, monkeys and all that. How many of them cook? <laughs> now, if they start learning how to cook, we're in trouble. <laughs> we need to move. But not too much. 
Not too much. <laughs> that's true. So that's another way of how our brain started. So what I what I do is um, there's also we're looking at you know another problem we have. How many of you know of people, somebody that has loss of bone, hip, knee, cartilage damage? It's very popular. I mean, I get you know how many athletes I I I right right now recommend for. PRP or ozone or stem cells therapy. Literally a hundred athletes a month call me and ask me, what do I do for my knee or hip or shoulder? Everybody has it. I don't care what age you are. Calcium is such an important nutrient. Okay? Uh, we talked about autophage, we talked about nicotine. Let me give you a sort of a, a, a landmark. Okay, let's, these are the factors of nutrition. We know it works. Nicetamide, I take true nitrogen every day. I take methylene blue every single morning. I'm going to be 70. I did a biological study on my age, and I'll give you the report if anybody wants to see it, with a cardiovascular surgeon who developed the iHeart. And twice he did it on me, and the iHeart report came back that my biological age when I did it was 67, my biological age was 25. He couldn't believe it, he said, I've done thousands of this. He said, I want you to come back, I gotta do it again. Two weeks, three weeks I go back there and I was worried that I'm gonna get really old. <laughs> I went in there and I'll, I'll show you, if anybody wants to see it, I have the eye report with me. The second time I did it, I was 24. The third time he did it, he said, there's no way, I've never seen any, I was 24 again. It's because of what I teach and what I practice. Okay, is how to eat right. Every morning I get up, I have a soft boiled egg, I have a poached egg, I have my collagen, that's it. I don't need anything else. Uh, uh, Tim Blake up there has known me for 20, 25 years. He knows what I do, right? And he can, do, he can tell you testimonials of all the people I work with. He knows them all. And at lunchtime, I have a protein and vegetable. At night, I try to cut down the amount of food, and I use a lot of red light, a lot of orange light. I expose myself to natural lighting all the time, all the time. I'm not afraid of cancer, okay? And that's what I do on a regular basis, and I do collagen. If you want any information, uh, you can go on Burn. Uh, Burn Freelander, Dr. Burn Freelander, Facebook, Instagram, and I'm also on Amazon. My products are on Amazon on their collagen renewal. And this new collagen renewal, we did an actual study way before with Ohio State in performance enhancing with several athletes there. And it was incredible. All right, let's see if anything else. I'm gonna finish up, and these are drugs that you should not be taking anyway. And that's it. Any questions? Intake. How do you avoid no, the I can't hear you. Speaking right into it. Yeah. Uh, oh, CO2 breathing. Quickly. Check, 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 check. Yeah. Okay. Two ways, check, three check. different methods of doing CO2 breathing. Take a deep breath and let it out through the nose. And then plug your nose, hold it for 30 to 40 to 60 seconds. You can walk, you can do, do not inhale anything. Okay, so you do this, and then again. And now, hold it, pinch your nose, and try to count. You may only be able to do it five seconds, in, but every day you increase it, do it several times. Reverses asthma. I've had three people right now in the club where we work out, asthma is gone. It does mental function. Right, Another burn, way. Burn. Let's, let's stick to the questions. Okay. We got about two minutes here and that's it. Hold on. Okay. I can show you more exercise when we How do you avoid kidney stones with the increase in calcium? Kidney stones is not caused by calcium. It's actually the opposite. The phosphorus level is too high. And that's why you gotta go into glothogene and read all about how kidney failure and bone failure is now a result of high phosphorus <coughs> By eliminating that and increasing calcium and vitamin D and vitamin K, you get rid of that. And I've done that with several people. 
Now, I have several friends who have kidney stones quite a bit, and they're in a lot of pain. So reduce phosphorus, add high calcium. I'm going to tell you, I take a lot of calcium. I take three or four thousand a day, and I eat. I try to eat a lot of high calcium foods. I'm going to tell you, calcium is important. How much nitrogen do you take? Hold on. I sit them I take. Uh, I take true nitrogen now. I'm starting. I'm doing a chromodesk study for them, and I take uh, 250 to 500 milligrams of true nitrogen, which is NR, or a thousand nicinamide in the morning. I, I've been doing nicinamide in the morning for a thousand with one drop of methylene blue from the fish tanks. Bert, the John, Mike, please don't answer the question, thanks. Yeah. So if you're a vegetarian and water, you know, the on grains and the vegetables, and so what's the answer? I mean, they all have fatty acids on you. Get them off. I mean, just cooking salts the problem? Or how do you have to sprout them? Or what's the answer? OK. The, the problem with vegetarian is you really need to take B12 so lately. You're deficient in B12. And B12 is such an important uh, B complex that is necessary. You, I have a lot of vegetarians, and I'll tell you what I do. They just increase their calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, vitamin K, and zinc. And they're able to function a lot better. I have a vegetarian who's got a tremendous uh, shoulder, loss of bone in the shoulder. She's doing this with, uh, she, you know, finally got her to do collagen, but she was in a lot of pain. But the calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, vitamin K, and B12, extremely got rid of the pain. And, and, and you got to do that. That's the only way you can do it, because you are consuming a lot of phosphorus food. Go into nutrition data, folks. You learn a lot from what you're eating. Once you understand the phosphorus levels you are consuming, is going to be a major factor. Yeah. What type of lab work? Can you say more about the name of the lab and what kind of lab does it is that measures the NADH and the You know what? For NADH, we're, uh, I, I was talking to, um, you know uh, Richard Maystayer? You know who he is? He's the, uh, he's the guru of uh, NADIV. They're working with a German and Australian company to come up with a very good NAD test. Right now, there isn't. It's a very, it's an intramuscular, it's an intracellular test, really. You've got to go intracellular. I was talking to Bruce Ames about it Let's years ago. Yeah. 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 So, there's no time for that. But Great, so now. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Do you want to stay here? No, 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 no. We, we've, got, we've got a break. We have another speaker. We want to respect right. his time. And so we need to cut things off. So we have a 10 minute break. You We're going to stop up. promptly at a quarter of nine. So join us then. If you have questions for Bern, you can ask them here. But once you're done with the questions, we, we need to come back right at a quarter of nine. Thank you.